avant-garde architecture, an intellectual bohemian population, and a resolutely modernist outlook. Barcelona is where a young Pablo Picasso first saw his future as an artist who'd send shockwaves through the 20th century. 50 years after his death, we've come to see where it all began. This is where Picasso took up painting seriously, at La Lotja Art School, aged 14, when the family moved here from their native Andalusia. Young Pablo was also immersed in the cosmopolitan atmosphere of the Catalan capital, meeting up with fellow artists at bars in the Gothic Quarter, still a popular spot a century later. Okay, so welcome to Als Quatre Gats. It means the four cats in Catalan. Uh, the building opens as a cafe in 1896 um, by Pere Romeo, who was inspired by the Parisian cafes, most notably Le Chat Noir, which is the black cat. He brings it to Barcelona and he calls it Als Quatre Gats. But what it was incredible uh, was as an artistic and modernist meeting point where the leading writers, um, painters, and intellectuals of the day would gather and discuss and it was an extremely beautiful bohemian vibe that was uh, present here in Barcelona, really as the meeting place. Did Picasso actually exhibit here? He did exhibit here, exactly. In uh, February of 1900, Picasso holds his first solo exhibition here. Uh, about a hundred different paintings and drawings and charcoal sketches of his friends and uh, patrons in, uh, in the city. And it's going to go over really, really well. Pere Romeo, following that exhibition, asks Picasso if you will design the official menu for the Quatre Gats, which um, is still the menu design today. Okay guys, so we're going to continue our visit of Picasso's life here in Barcelona, so follow me. Now we're going to the Picasso Museum. The museum was founded with the help of Picasso's friend, Jaume Sabartes, 60 years ago, while the artist was living in exile in France. Emmanuel Guigon, hello. This is the first Picasso museum to be opened during the artist's lifetime. What does that tell us about his relationship with this town, Barcelona? This museum was something Picasso wanted to achieve. It was his wish at the end of the 1950s in the middle of the Franco years. We know that Picasso, a committed communist at the time, never went back to Spain after 1934. So the collection housed in this museum bears witness to his relationship with the city. It also shows the love he had for Barcelona until his dying day. We see some paintings here that were done when Picasso was still just a teenager. What do they tell us about that period of his life when he lived here in Barcelona? This museum has some important examples from Picasso's academic training as a painter. This canvas, the First Communion, and you also have another masterpiece, Science and Charity, which won second prize in a national competition. We can see here that Picasso was already extremely talented. He learned to paint from his father, who played a very important role in those formative years, and who actually serves as his model for male portraits until 1900. Picasso discovered modernism when he was very young, thanks to his Catalan friends, and also through modern Parisian paintings from artists like Toulouse-Lautrec, Degas, etc. We have a very rich selection from that period in our collection, all the way up until the Blue period, where Picasso starts to inhabit his own style, the world of Picasso. This painting, Las Meninas, was a gift from Picasso to the museum. Can you tell us about its inspirations and what it says? Picasso. In the months of August and September 1957, Picasso created a series of 58 variations inspired by this absolute masterpiece painted by the Spanish artist Velázquez, which now hangs in the Prado Museum. Picasso consumed the world to produce Picassos. He represented himself here as a painter who's looking back at the old masters of the Spanish Golden Age. The variations we have in this museum are absolutely extraordinary and there's certainly a major reason to come here and see the collection. Imagine 
in 1936, Picasso was successful, prolific, and established in the French capital. Meanwhile, in Spain, General Franco was attempting to overthrow the Republic, and in 1937, with the help of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, he carried out the bombing of the Basque town of Guernica, killing 2,000 civilians. It was among the darkest moments of the Spanish Civil War, and it changed the course of Picasso's career. Est-ce que si vous deviez choisir vous-même l'époque, la peinture, la toile qui devrait vous survivre, est-ce que quelle serait cette toile, quelle serait cette période Je ne sais pas, c'est pas c'est difficile. C'est fait avec des intentions tellement du moment, de l'époque et de l'état dans lequel tout le monde et moi nous nous trouvons, que c'est très difficile. Au moment de Guernica, j'ai fait Guernica, n'est-ce pas Parce que c'était une grande catastrophe. First, he had a project for the international fair in Paris to um do a big painting about um, a painter and a model, but he changed his mind and decided to describe the aurora of Guernica. This is how he really um, pivoted into a, a, a very strong political engagement. So um, my grandfather tried probably to show what is reality, because it was a, a time when you didn't have the instant news, the breaking news. You, you got everything a few days after, and maybe with some kind of um, distance, the depth, the innocence of children and women, the animals. With Guernica, you are the center of the drama. So Pablo was more into an, an universal message of hope, but also to show what is the reality, who are the real victims of those of the civil war, for sure, and of any war in general. Not only a powerful symbol of the struggle against Franco's dictatorship, Guernica has become synonymous with pacifism and resistance around the world. Every year, 3.5 million people visit the painting at the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid. Today, Picasso stands as a giant among artists and a complex figure accused of misogyny. But his contribution to modernism is indisputable, revolutionizing painting, sculpture and ceramics. Now a series of exhibitions around the world invites us to reconsider that body of work 50 years after his death. The Picasso Museum in Paris is presenting the collection in a new light and they've asked British fashion designer Paul Smith to curate the show. Paul Smith, hello. Hello. You were given carte blanche for this show, so what angle did you decide to come at it from? Well, uh, initially overwhelming, and so the angle was uh, let's get it in some sort of order, either chronological or in periods of time from a, uh, a visual point of view, so cubism or uh, blue period or collage. What I didn't really realise is how pr uh, prolific he was and also how he was so willing to admit that he was influenced by Cezanne or if, uh, he was looking back at Manet at one point and of course he was really visual so he would often find things in the street and make a sculpture out of them like the famous horns and the bull's head you know which is in fact, what we use for the poster. Paul Smith, Paul Smith has a keen visual sense. He knows exactly what makes an image accessible, popular. And for an artist like Picasso, who's undoubtedly the most famous artist in the world, it was interesting to see how his work and his character, Picasso the man, have almost become icons in and of themselves. As someone who works with patterns and motifs in your day-to-day -day activity, what's your take on Picasso's use of stripes? I mean, especially the one behind me, I think is a, a fantastic use of stripes. And so things like pattern on pattern on pattern, which is what he did in this room, uh, would make a great shirt, a piece of knitwear. I, I think a lot of it would translate into, into clothes. As a designer yourself, you're known for respecting certain traditions while also breaking or bending mm, the yeah. rules. How did you bring that gently iconoclastic attitude to this show? I mean, what, the main thing was to absolutely respect the artistic talent of Picasso, but then adding some sort of modernity or 
a different way of looking at it. And that's normally to do with colour, pattern, uh, or fun in some cases. I think he would have enjoyed the humour, I hope. There has been a reconsideration of Picasso's place in the history of art, uh, largely due to his personal life, his character, his treatment of some of the women around him. How much can we dissociate that issue with the artwork he produced over his lifetime? The question regarding Picasso and his relationships with women is obviously very, very pertinent. I'd say most of all for younger generations, new wave feminists, and we understand all too well why today Picasso's behaviour towards women would be seen as inappropriate and quite difficult to accept. These questions are very important, and at the Picasso Museum, we certainly want to address them. And we think it's better to respond to these challenges by using the work of the artists themselves. This exhibition shows how Picasso's legacy looms large in contemporary work. Micheline Thomas drew inspiration from his picture and skeleton for her piece, Resist No. 8, evoking the civil rights movement in the United States. Picasso pops up in Congolese artist Sherry Samba's work as he interrogates geopolitical themes. And Nigerian artist Obi Okibo's use of ancestral African stories hints at Picasso's collection of art from that continent and his timeless quality. Picasso reinvented himself, not even with each style or era, but with each piece. There's the innocence and the curiosity in which he approaches each piece. Also, I think his visionary, because he kind of predicted in a way that his works will last forever and become like the antiques that he was um, inspired by. And so again, it becomes this transmission from generation to generation. He has been uh, absent for 50 years, but in the same time, he was very present. His talent, his subjects are just like, um, like us. He sees things that we don't see. This is the modernity of Picasso. Mm -hmm.